Don't forget to like this video and please subscribe to this channel. But don't do that right now, all right? We live in a time of images, image. Look at these pictures here. The Marlboro Man. David Beckham. And Roger Federer and Martin Luther King for Rolex watches. Images. We, we never see, unless it was a joke on Saturday Night Live or something like that, we never see a guy on the screen, hey, I'm a loser. You want to buy this car that I'm sitting in? Or, hey, I, I just stink. I'm just a horrible person, but man, I can smoke some cigarettes. Buy them. Or the cologne, or the watch. It's about image. We want to be winners. That's our goal. That's what the world's goal is. And yet we come to the scriptures and we see something so countercultural. We look for heroes. God looks for servants. And so as we look at this story, we're going to be talking about Gideon again, the, the one judge in Scripture that is talked about the most. He's got 100 verses dedicated to him as opposed to Samson's 96. So I would love it if you would open your Bible to Judges chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, there's one there in the pew rack right in front of you. Pull that out, maybe on your phone or on a tablet. Take the time, and I want you to see these verses. I want you to see what God is trying to teach us this morning. So let's pray and then allow this story that many of you have heard over and over. You've probably seen the flannel graph or the film strip or the... Uh, Maybe there's been a, even a movie that you've seen or you learned in Sunday school or children's church. But let's once again look at this old time story to teach us what God wants to, us to have for this morning. So let's pray. Father, thank you again for your faithfulness. Thank you that you've called on us uh, to be set apart, to be different. And so you didn't just tell us that, but you gave us these stories, these true stories, so that when, we, when the times of doubt and the hard times come, these stories would come back to mind and go, well, if, if, if you were a hero to Gideon, you're that same God. You haven't lost power over the years, and your desire is to have your will and way in our lives. And if we trust you and obey you, uh, it's amazing what you can do. So, God, would you use this time uh, once again for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. You see God beginning to, to develop his people by putting them in situations that teach them that their strength lies in depending on him uh, and his unchanging word. Okay? Point number one, we must reduce. We must reduce. And some of you, would l you love hearing that. You, as you think about your closet, as you think about your garage, you think about minimize. Um, but let's look at what the Lord has to teach us here. Go to Judges chapter 7 and beginning at verse 1. Then Jeroboam, remember he had gotten that name because it means conqueror of Baal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early, and encamped beside the spring of Harad, and the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. So Gideon and his forces, they're setting up camp beside this spring. They're at the foothills of Mount Gelboa in the Jezreel Valley. They could look north and east for about 10 miles. And when Gideon and his forces take a look, they see huge numbers of the enemy plus their camels, and they're going to be going against 135,000 troops, 
Okay, we see this in Judges 8.10. So next chapter will tell us, but we'll see these verses here, Judges 8.10. And you could just do the math. You see the 15,000 and the 120,000. You do the math, that's 135,000. I know, pretty amazing, isn't it? Um, But look at verse 2 with me. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you, get this, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. And why? Lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. So Gideon has 32,000 men. So remember the number before of the Midianites? 135,000. Okay? And God tells him, That's too many. Now let's just stop and think about the whole art of war. As you and I look at those stats there, That's four to one, and that's still, in our minds, bad. I'm thinking, are we all in agreement that you'd like to bring more people to that kind of fight? And God says to him, no. And here's why. God does not want them to think they won the victory. Now, there's going to be times in your life that certain things are going to arise, and they're going to be big I hear people sometimes say, God won't give you more than you can handle. That's nowhere in the Bible. Okay, here's what he gives you, what you can't handle. And then you go, I need God. I need God. And so we have a four to one odds there. Now remember these numbers as we work through those together. So, and I want you to remember also this. Gideon tested God on the fleece issue twice, if you remember that last week. So God's going to test Gideon by cutting his numbers twice. All right, look at number three, or verse three. Now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. And look at this. Then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. So he gives them an out. He goes, okay, 32,000. Any of you guys that are afraid, you can leave now. (laughs) It's it's good. And they hit the road. 22,000. I mean, right away, the numbers drop. So the first way that he cuts the numbers is inviting any of them to do that. And according to the law of God... Uh, One law of the warfare was to give those afraid an option to go home. And we see that in Deuteronomy 20. No question asked, no explanations were needed. When uh, When you've got this situation, look at what he says here in Deuteronomy 20. This is the law given to the people of Israel. And the officers shall speak further to the people and say, Is there any man who is fearful and faint hearted? Let him go back to his house and look at the reason. Gives a reason lest he make the heart of his fellows melt like his own. Can you see that? God knows this. Fear is contagious. If you're around people that are fearful, it has an impact. I, I watch this even in sporting events. When something starts to happen, you're up, you're winning. And a team starts getting on a roll. And if you've ever been with this, where your team starts going, and you just sense the nervousness start to hit. And basic plays that you have played over and over and over again, just routine ground balls, routine pop-ups, it's like fear comes over the team, and you have to nip that in the bud. And if you don't allow that talk to stop, You'll see negative talk amongst teammates. You'll see different things going on. It can, it can devastate a team. That's just in the realm of sports. Think about that in a home. Think about that in a church. We need to trust God. We need to believe God. If we get to be people that are fearful and we aren't believing God and we're not trusting God, it can be contagious. And God gives an out here to the people of Israel. He says, if any of you are afraid, go home. 
And who wouldn't be afraid? Think about that. 135,000, there's 32,000 of us. They got the camels, which is the modern warfare of that time. They've been winning year after year after year after year. You've been losing. I don't know if you guys remember, you know I like the Chicago Cubs. You know that in 2016, they, they won the World Series finally. Okay. But I'm watching that last game. And they're playing the Indians, seriously. And it's the seventh game, and it's, it's getting to be where, hey, we're ahead. We're going to win. And then some things started happening. And I go, I'm just sitting there. And I look over at Ben. I go, they're doing it again. And fear <laughs> came over me. Then there was like a rain delay, which is like, yes. Somebody did a speech in the locker room, and they won. But left to my understanding of what was going to go on, they were going to lose because they've always lost. No amens. (laughs) That's a defiant heart. We will pray for you. So so 22,000 leave. 10,000 remain, so we've moved from odds of 4 to 1 to now 35 to 1. Look at verses 4 through 8. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lap, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the, Gideonites, the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his home. So the people took provisions into their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. So what we have here is got too many. Send, send them, and they're all thirsty. Sends them over to the water, and the ones that basically put their face in the water and drank leave. The ones that take the water like this, they stay. So 9,700 9, drink like canines, all right? The other drink like this. And over the years, I remember in Sunday school class, I don't know if you were taught this, but I was taught this. And what happened with that? I remember Mr. Gabriel, he's sitting there, and we're all sitting there, and he's talking the whole thing through, and it was kind of exciting, talking these stories. And he says, and here's why God picked them. God picked them because they scooped up, and they were looking around ready for battle. Now, that sounds good, but it's not in the Bible. By the way, Mr. Gabriel is an amazing man, okay? But... As I grew older and I started looking at I didn't see, they said, sometimes you'll hear them say, and they were ready with their weapons. You'll hear later what their weapons, weapons were, all right? And so here's what I think happened. The bigger number left, and the smaller number stays. Because if it is about awareness or about their activity along those lines, then they still get credit. And so God is about those that are humble. And that's the ones he exalts. And so 300 are left. Listen to the odds. 400 to 1. These are impossible odds, unless God is on your side. And we've got Gideon, who, let's face it, 
wouldn't he maybe be tempted to go, any of you that are afraid, you can leave, and 22,000 leave, and he goes, see you guys, <laughs> I'm out of here too. But he's got, he's got bravery. Look at what, they, what the Bible says about him in the book of Hebrews. Actually, it talks about a few people here in the book of Hebrews. It says, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Isn't it good to know that this is God's job. This is God's business. And he's looking for those that are available. And so we've got this guy. Remember the mighty man of valor that was threshing wheat in a wine press because he's terrified? He's in the wrong place for the wrong job. And yet God shows up and says, you mighty man of valor, as he's hiding. I want you to see throughout this, fear can still be something that is a part of the believer's life. And yet we trudge on. We, we keep going here. So we've got 400 to 1 odds. Well, point number two is we must remember. We must remember. I want to build on something for a moment before we move into that. And that is that we come to a story in chapter or in the book of Second Corinthians where Earlier in these verses, I'm going to give you a Reader's Digest verse, and I just want to tell you, Paul saw heaven before he died. The Apostle Paul saw heaven before he died. And we come to these verses here in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, and I want you to see how you and I would look at certain situations and go, I can't believe that God would be in this because the numbers are so low, or I, I just don't know how we're going to deal with this. And yet this gives God glory. Look what happened. So he saw heaven. And so this is what he says next. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, the fact that he saw heaven and he was exposed to things that no other man had seen, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. I want you to stop and think about that for a moment. You ever have things happen in your life and you go, why is God allowing this? It could be for you as a Christian so that you wouldn't think you're that big of a deal. And you'll see other Christians and they're getting all these blessings or you, and you don't know what's going on really in their lives. Sometimes we think we know what's going on in everybody's life. We don't know. We don't know the pain they're dealing with. We don't know. But you'll watch and you go, what is the deal? What is God trying to teach me? Part of it may be he just wants to keep you humble. Thanks, God. Three times. Look at this. this. This is a man of prayer. He goes, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. I don't want to deal with this anymore. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, look at this, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Now, how many people do you see doing that? Honestly, when people are proud, they're, they aren't proud of their weaknesses. They're proud of their stuff. Okay? I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Wow. That way, God gets the glory. So God shows Gideon that he's going to give him the victory. Look at verses 9 through 11. That same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. Now, I want you to notice this next verse here. But if you are afraid to go down... Go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go, against, go down against the camp. 
Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now think about that. Earlier it said, the beginning of verse 10, but if you are afraid to go down, go down. And I want you to look at the end of the verse. So he went down. He's afraid. That's why he's going down there. And that same night, God had dropped that number to 300. He asks him to take his trusted servant Pura down with him. They go down the Midian camp, and they eavesdrop on the conversation here. I want you to think about this for a second. I love visualizing these kind of things. It's just kind of fun to think about it. These are real life and death situations. This isn't a game. This isn't capture the flag. I know my, your heart beats during hide and seek or capture the flag when you were a kid. You're excited, kick the can, whatever game you guys played. All right? Some of you, maybe it's a video game. I don't know. All right? And, but the, he's told, I want you to go down. I want you, and if you're afraid, take this guy. Okay, I'm going to go down. Pura and I are going to go down. They've got to go down in the dark close enough to this camp that these people would kill them. Be quiet. They're doing it in the dark. I know you're like, you keep saying that. But that takes time. All the time going down, not making noise, going to just the right tent to hear what he's about to hear. Now, can you see the sovereignty of God in this and the timing of the conversation that we're about to hear? God lines up all of these things. He lines up the fact that this person's going to have a dream. He lines up the fact that he's going to be talking to this guy loud enough so that Gideon and his friend hear this. This is the hand of God. And this is what God does to give affirmation, to give encouragement to this person. Look at verse uh, 12 here. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance. You ever see something like that? Bugs like in abundance. This is the picture here. And their camels were without number. These things are big. They're loud. As the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. So you've got these midnight camp and it's huge. So he keeps going there. When Gideon came, verse 13, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. So he gets earshot of this camp. He hears a man relating a dream that's bizarre. I've got a little bagel up here. This is Jewish, all right? So pretend it's barley, okay? Now, think about this. This thing comes rolling down the hill, and there's a tent there. It rolls down, and it hits that tent and smashes it. I don't know if this would knock anything down really anywhere. If I threw it at you guys, you'd just laugh at me, all right? But he, and I know you're like, no, it was barley bread. A loaf of bread is much bigger than a bagel, Pastor Mark. Thank you. (laughs) I don't know of anybody bowling barley bread, say that three times fast, um, that it would knock down a tent. You haven't seen the tents we've put up. Whatever the case, these guys, they know how to build, set up tents. They know how to do this. And this picture is given, okay? It would be like if you had a, a BB and you're bowling. And you roll it down there, and it knocks all the pins down. In fact, it just uh, destroys them, all right? This is the picture. But this is this crazy dream that is used to communicate a truth. Look at verse 14. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. So the fear of the people of God is now in these people's lives. And so as you and I take a stand for Christ and we desire to serve the Lord, the things that would push against that 
And I want to always be careful that I don't make our enemies flesh and blood. The people that are out there. It's so easy to do this, especially in our political times. We go, these people, they just don't get it. And this person that is pro this, that, that I think, boy, the Bible doesn't... Of course, I'm not going to agree about certain things because I want to line myself up with the Scriptures. But those people, I've got to remember, they're not my enemy. Okay? Ideologies. Um, philosophies that don't line up the scriptures, that is the enemy, okay? And I want to be a person that is believing and trusting God. And so those things collapse, when you think about it, when lined up with the truth of the scriptures. The grace of God is the most powerful thing. The, the, the gospel is the power of God. It's the dy- dynamos is what the word says. Okay, we come to verse, so we see that in verse 14, how this one responds. Look at verse 15. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped. Isn't that great? He stopped right there and he gave glory to God. Let me ask you this morning. I, don't, I hope you don't relegate worship to just this time. But as God does things, as he answers prayer, that you, it literally your car would be a place of worship as you, as you come to understand, wow, God, you did that. You answered that prayer. You took care of that. Whatever that place may be, that that would be a place of worship. And he says, so he worshiped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, arise. For the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. He's trusting God. He's believing. He worships God. And he realizes this. Get this. 135,000 Midianites are not fighting 300 Israelis. The reality is this. 135,000 Midianites are fighting God. And he returns to camp and he announces Victory. And God is the one that is giving the victory. Look at verse 16. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into their hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. So he divides the men into these three companies of 100. They're armed with these, these, these um, weapons here. Remember, he... It's not weapons where they were. These are the weapons. A trumpet, a pitcher, an empty pitcher, and then a torch. I couldn't put a torch on the communion table. I just didn't feel right about doing that, all right? So I got a candle there representing that. And so if you can have that idea. Oh, and one more weapon, their voice. One more weapon. There's no swords. There's no spears. There's no bows. There's no arrows. So think about that. Think about sometimes the weapons of our warfare. The sword that we have is the word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So look at verses 17 and 18. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, Then blow the trumpets also on every side of the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So he gives them that order, surround the camp, blow the trumpets, shout for the Lord, smash those pitchers, shine the light. Okay, and what was happening was inside the pitcher, and I know that's kind of a transparent pitcher there, but inside was the torch that would have been hidden, and they're surrounding the camp. And we see what else goes on here. Look at verse, um, this point number three, we must resound, we must resound. Look at verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him come to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just set the watch and they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. So let's, let's get that picture. What's going on? So we got the torch in there. We got that. They're going on, sneaking around. 
I got the trumpet. And by the way, I've tried to learn how to blow this. It just sounds like wind going through this thing. All right. But we have a worship leader that can blow this. <laughs> I'll tell you when. Ready, Gideon? All right. So he's on my, on my cue here. Okay. Go. Get around. And then Gideon blew. <laughs> Let's hear it for Gideon. All right. So, excellent job. Thank you. I was going to go, doo, 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 and you guys, it would have been completely unbelievable. So thank you for your skill set. All right. And so they crack that, and this whole light breaks out on these people. And did you read or with me? You saw that it was in a time of a watch. And so what's going on during that watch probably, most likely, is people are moving back to their tents. So you got guys going, hey, that wasn't that a nice watch? Yeah, that was a nice watch. And there's some that are getting up out of their tents because it's now their turn to go to the watch. Now, it shows us a little bit of Gideon's giftedness with timing as a mighty warrior. I think God may have looked at him. I'm not surprised by this. God looked at him and goes, this guy has warrior capability. He called it, you're a mighty warrior. And so he gives it to him. But I don't know how much of this was God's idea or Gideon's idea. All I know is that combined God did it because it's for the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. God, isn't God gracious? He includes us in his, the victories. But we have to get, be to the point where we don't go, and I did this. All right, so we see that going on. And look at verse, so let me read that again, verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him come to the outskirts of the camp, beginning of the middle watch, when they had just set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew their trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And you see what starts to happen here. And this whole thing is a a matter of trusting God, obeying God. We don't know how he's going to do what he's going to do, but we trust him and we see him here. Look at verse 21. Every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran. They cried and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shitta toward Zerorah, as far as the border of Abel Mehaloh by Tabith. Okay, so we see him here, and each man... Stands his ground. The Midianite army starts running around in a total panic. Could you imagine the camels that have been spooked and stampeding? I don't know if you saw just the other day on um, the news, I saw a bison stampede that ran into a car. It freaked those people out. Somebody was YouTubing and somebody was videotaping it with their camera. And the thing hit the car and just crunched it. And people were freaked out in just that. Could you imagine at night with... Guys break out the sword, they hear, they hear the trumpet, they see light, they start killing each other. What's going on? Complete mayhem. And all God's people that are around, they're just up there. They're just watching. They can't take any glory for it that they did something. It was the work of God as these are defeating themselves. It's just a, an incredible picture of what God can do. They can't take any credit. It all goes to God. And so it says here that God set a sword against each other, and the Midianites are killing each other. Look at verse uh, 23. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali, and from Asher, and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they captured the waters as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. And they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb 
and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. Then they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. So others started to begin to rally around Gideon. Men of Israel, they're summoned, and they respond, and they completely routed the Midianites. Let's stop and think about this. It is ridiculous that 300 men would beat 135,000. In fact, there's a movie out called 300, talking about the Spartans, that people just love this movie. It's impressive how they took a stand. This story from the scriptures here, there's no swords brought out until the end as they pursue the enemy. But God gets the complete glory. I like, we looked at 2 Corinthians earlier when we were looking at the whole idea of my, my grace is sufficient for you. Look at these verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and think about this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. That's us. We're just dust. We're just dirt. We're jars of clay. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. I want you to realize that for much of what God wants to accomplish in your life, and might, right now you may be going through a difficult time, and if you are, I'm sorry. Difficult times aren't easy. I'd hope that we'd all come along each other, uh, side each other when those times come. But did you notice what had to happen for there to be victory? That jar had to be broken so that the light could shine. And there's something about, I don't know about you, but for me, there's something about when somebody in their weakness owns it and says, I needed the Lord, and they just share that kind of testimony. That is such a blessing. I've never been blessed by a testimony where said, you know, I, I pretty much have this all figured out. This Christian life, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. I got it all figured out. It's, I don't get God sometimes, but I'm going to trust him. And as he continues to break me, I'm going to be understanding that he's to, trying to conform me to the image of his son. It doesn't mean that you have to always like it. And it doesn't mean that all the time you have to be brave. Let me ask you a couple questions. Have there been times in your life when God has weakened you so that you can see more clearly that he is the one who saves. Has there been times in your life where that's happened? And then secondly, have there been times when God has weakened you and then worked through your weakness? Let's pray. Father, thank you.